गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो इन द सीरीज ऑफ द टाटा लेक्चर्स आई टेक दिस ऑपरचुनिटी टू इन्वाइट प्रोफेसर जेम्स यू फॉर हिज नेक्स्ट लेक्चर टूडे द टॉपिक इज अड्रेसिंग ट्रांसलेशनल गैप्स इन रीजेनरेटिव मेडिसिन एंड एज वी ऑल नो प्रोफेसर वू इज एन एसोसिएट डायरेक्टर एंड चीफ ऑपरेशन प्रोग्राम ऑफिसर इन द वेक फॉरेस्ट इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ रीजेनरेटिव मेडिसिन वेक फॉरेस्ट यूनिवर्सिटी वेलकम प्रोफेसर यू Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, good morning. Uh, first, I would like to thank um, the director, um, uh, Dr. Shiv uh, Sarin, uh, and of course, uh, Professor uh, Subnet um, Kaur uh, for uh, inviting me and my colleague, uh, you know, Dr. Lee here to your institution. Uh, you know, we've been here all week. And it uh, has been an eye-opening experience, and uh, and we have uh, interacted with many of the the colleagues, uh, you know, at the institute, and we were just impressed uh, at the level of their knowledge and expertise in liver. Of course, you know, I'm not an expert in liver. Um, I don't know what I'm expert in, but. Um, Uh, but it was, I was, uh, you know, truly uh, impressed, uh, you know, at the level uh, of uh, knowledge and experience that you guys have. So, uh, you know, it is our honor uh, to be here uh, today and share our work and hope that our work uh, could lead to a productive collaboration in the future. The other day, uh, I have shared uh, with uh, some of you uh, on in regenerative medicine and the approaches that we take to uh, develop new tissues and organs for clinical applications. And uh, what I would like to do today is, you know, uh, the process of translating uh, a therapy is not all that rosy. And the pictures uh, and images and experience that I share with you are the best ones, right? So, uh, of course, uh, you know, the research path is uh, a long journey Uh, you know, with uh, so many different um, challenges, uh, not only scientific challenges, but uh, technological challenges, manufacturing challenges, regulatory challenges, uh, and so on. So uh, what, uh, you know, for today's um, talk, I would like to uh, share uh, some of the approaches to uh, overcome Uh, one of the greatest uh, challenges that we all face, not only in regenerative medicine, but in surgery and transplantation, uh, you know, uh, surgery as well. So uh, just to recap um, the other day's lecture, uh, we uh, basically developed tissues and organs uh, for clinical applications, uh, and there are three approaches uh, that we have followed uh, for over uh, 30 years, and uh, they all utilize, uh, you know, cells, biomaterials, and um, biological factors to develop uh, tissues and organs uh, for patient treatment. You know, when we uh, use cells alone, we're uh, trying to enhance cellular function uh, so that we could improve tissue function. We sometimes use biomaterials uh, to promote regeneration and, uh, you know, pro uh, stimulate the body's uh, you know, uh, uh, capacity uh, to uh, regenerate tissues, uh, you know, within our body system. Uh, but, you know, when uh, damages or the, uh, the tissues and organs that are extent, uh, then, you know, we combine cells and biomaterials to develop engineered tissue that uh, eventually gets implanted in uh, patients or in the body. Uh, that's where Uh, these uh, cells uh, 
you know, become mature and become functional tissues. So how do we use this strategy, the strategy of using cells, biomaterials, and biological factors? How do we uh, actually uh, use it in practice? So, you know, this is an example of letter, but it, uh, you know, applies to, uh, you know, other organs as well. So when a patient comes uh, into a clinic with you know, certain disease or certain conditions, then we would take a small tissue biopsy from the patients, isolate patient cells, and grow them in large quantities. And when we collect all, you know, uh, have uh, adequate number of cells, then we would collect them and then place them onto a supporting matrix, a framework that would allow the cells to, uh, call, you know, to uh, grow, you know, within that, uh, you know, framework. And then the uh, we call it constructs. Construct containing patient cells are then. Uh, placed back into the patients uh, for tissue repair or tissue replacement uh, or augmentation. So this is an example uh, of how we utilize and apply this strategy to patients. So following this uh, you know, strategy, we have brought a number of uh, applications uh, for patients, uh, you know, which uh, has like bladder, you know, where we uh, try to enhance uh, tissue, uh, bladder tissue function. Uh, for urethra, you know, for we treated patients with uh, urethral stricture due to trauma and uh, restored normal anatomy and function. And uh, recently we have uh, um, treated, uh, you know, patients who were born without uh, vaginal tissue or vaginal vault. And uh, in this case, we were able to create new tissues and uh, provided a whole new tissue system uh, for patients which uh, really uh, impacted their quality of lives, uh, you know, throughout their lives. So, uh, so as you can see, tissue engineering has initial successes in number of uh, you know uh, p applications in uh, in many patients. However, there are challenges that uh, we face uh, when we try to develop uh, tissues and organ systems. Especially, that's true when we're trying to develop a complex uh, you know organs like kidneys or uh, you know uh, or liver. Uh, that require systemic function or uh, tissues that require coordinated function. So in those cases, you know, we do face uh, a lot of uh, challenges, uh, scientific and other, uh, you know, manufacturing challenges. Uh, so what are these challenges? You know, there, you know, uh, there are so many, you know, over a million and five different challenges and, uh, you know, restrictions and, um, you know, these are, I've listed uh, a few that is, uh, you know, representative and very major uh, challenges that we need to uh, overcome in order to develop a good tissue and organs for patients. And uh, they are like vascularization. Uh, it doesn't really matter how well you build tissues outside the body. The challenge is how do we, uh, you know, transport for it into the body and integrate it so that the uh, engineered tissue can be functional. Uh, so vascularization is uh, the, uh, you know, I do think that is the most important and critical uh, challenge that we face, you know. And, you know, other challenges, I'm not saying that they're not important, but they're, every uh, challenge is important and we need to overcome these challenges. Uh, and other challenges include innervation, you know, developing tissue-specific biomaterials where cells can uh, mature into a functional tissue, you know, cell source too. You know, where do we get the cells? You know, in uh, areas where we're, uh, we have easy access uh, to cells, it's no problem, but let's say, like, heart. You know, are we going to take patient's heart and, uh, you know, isolate cells from patient's heart, only heart? Or, 
Yeah, so it, you know, it is challenging. Or brain, brain tissue too. So, uh, you know, cell, developing cell source and, uh, you know, uh, that could be used uh, across uh, many patient groups uh, would be one of the challenges that we face in the field. And then, of course, how do we deliver these cells into a very small three-dimensional uh, uh, you know, uh, scaffolds uh, in an organized fashion. That, that uh, also is a challenge. And how do we uh, mature tissue, uh, you know, when we, uh, you know, implant it? Um, so these are some of the, uh, you know, few uh, challenges uh, that we uh, face. So one cha you know, uh, challenge, uh, engineering challenge, uh, that I would like to share, uh, you know, our perspective and your thoughts um, is the engineering challenge. You know, developing scaffolds uh, is, uh, you know, incredibly important. And how do we fabricate those, uh, uh, you know, um, Scaffolds. A scaffolds is a framework that would eventually guide the cells to become certain, uh, you know, tissues and organs. So, uh, you know, it is very difficult to replicate uh, the complex vascular network that we have in our body. You know, we just do not have the the technology to replicate it and mimic, uh, and you know, exactly the same. Or the complex microarchitecture that we have uh, in our, uh, you know, tissues and organs, uh, you know, like liver and kidney, you know, those microarchitecture is very difficult to replicate with, uh, you know, with the, you know, especially with uh, your, uh, you know, your own hands. So many um, technologies have been developed. Um, so I would like to focus my talk uh, on vascularization because because it uh, is very important uh, to many uh, different fields uh, uh, in medicine. And so, uh, you know, when we uh, engineer and build tissues outside the body, okay, so uh, when we uh, transfer it into our body, you know, establishing adequate vascularization is a key and critical component for the cells within the scaffold to survive. You know, and, you know, that has been a challenge, uh, you know, throughout, uh, you know, uh, the history. Uh, of course, there have been many uh, strategies and many approaches that were introduced uh, over the years. Uh, however, uh, you know, they are not uh, really satisfactory and there's no, uh, you know, definite uh, answer or definite solution to, um, you know, address vascularization. But vascularization is very important in the integration uh, and uh, survival of the tissue that you implant. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, the strategies uh, include uh, use of biological, uh, you know, uh, factors like uh, vascular endothelial cell-like uh, growth factors or VGF uh, or endothelial cells. They promote, uh, you know, uh, neoangiogenesis or you know, angiogenesis uh, in our body, and they can stimulate uh, and enhance angiogenesis. However, the problem is that they cannot accelerate the process of uh, vascularization. So, uh, you know, there are thousands of uh, different uh, publications uh, in the literature. However, uh, you know, the, the proof, the concept and the principle of angiogenesis using uh, uh, growth factors or endothelial cells or any other uh, factors that uh, stimulate, uh, you know, body's ability to uh, make new blood vessel, uh, you know, only works in a small tissue. Let's say if you were to build a, you know, a uh, bigger tissue, like uh, a tissue that's about five centimeter uh, thick in all dimensions. Now, when you implant that in your body, it takes a very long time for the body to make new blood vessels uh, starting from the periphery and penetrate uh, deeply towards the center. So uh, in, in general, our body makes uh, new blood vessels at, the, at a distance of uh, one millimeter per day. 
So imagine if you are building a five centimeter thick uh, tissue, and assuming that the uh, body works uh, from uh, all sides, it would take approximately 20, 25 days, or even 30 days uh, for the body to make new blood vessel that would, uh, you know, uh, crawl towards the center to uh, provide nutrients and oxygen to cells. And how many cells do you know of uh, that could survive for 25 days without food and nutrient? Probably not many, right? Uh, especially like hepatocytes and liver cells, they're very sensitive. Uh, so, uh, so even though principle works and uh, the concept works uh, in practicality, in reality, it is very hard to uh, adapt this strategy in real patient scenario. So what we have uh, thought about was, well, you know, so if it takes the body uh, that long to make new blood vessels that would, uh, you know, make the cells, in the, especially in the center core, to survive, uh, you know, can we you know, provide the cells uh, with necessary, uh, you know, ingredients like oxygen, you know, it's, which is critical, right? If we uh, do not have oxygen, we cannot breathe and we'll die in five minutes, right? So, uh, so can we uh, develop uh, an oxygen generating particle and uh, embed it into a scaffolding system so that the scaffold would continuously release oxygen uh, and uh, make the cells live longer. So that's, uh, you know, this is uh, the oxygen, uh, you know, generated uh, from uh, the scaffolds, uh, from the particles. Uh, another way is, well, can we uh, make the cells longer or require the cells to, um, you know, uh, require less um, nutrients. So can we decrease their, uh, you know, cellular metabolism so that they would require less energy? So uh, we have, uh, you know, tried, uh, used uh, an, a substance called adenosine that really uh, decreases the, the cellular uh, needs for nutrients. And, uh, nutrients. So uh, we have, uh, you know, um, looked at different aspect to solve, uh, you know, vascularization. And not one approach uh, would, would work, but, you know, I think if we combine these approaches, uh, you know, we may have a better luck. So in the meantime, you know, how can we, uh, you know, develop or use uh, a vascular system that uh, we could use to build. So one approach that, uh, you know, uh, is decellularization, uh, meaning that you take a, uh, an organ and use the organ as a template uh, to build tissues. So uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, discussed this um, at the other session, uh, but I would like to also share uh, some of our experience uh, in liver tissue. So, uh, so if, you know, the donor tissue has all, you know, it is an identical uh, organ as uh, the organ that you have body, in your body. So the idea is remove all the cells from a donor organ, uh, preserving the uh, structure, you know, intact. And then the idea is to replace uh, the removed or, uh, cells with the cells of interest and then uh, use that as a, a scaffold to build tissues that could be functional. So uh, we have um, uh, taken a, a pig porcine uh, liver, as you see here, and uh, developed a protocol that removes all the cellular components from the entire liver, as you see here, uh, leaving uh, the uh, native uh, vasculature intact. This is a normal vasculature, and this is the vasculature uh, after uh, removal of all cells. And we have, uh, you know, demonstrated that uh, these uh, cells, uh, there's uh, the structure is uh, maintained. And then the next step would be to um, 
to then repopulate the cells into the uh, decellularized, um, you know, uh, organ. So uh, we uh, developed a st uh, st uh, protocol to uh, repopulate cells that includes vascular cells, which is very critical uh, in uh, maintaining blood flow without clotting. So uh, we have done that and also have uh, developed a way to uh, repopulate the liver construct with hepatocytes as well. So uh, then we took the cell seeded, uh, decellularized whole liver, and then implanted in the uh, same pig uh, where the cells came from. And uh, this is after implantation. Uh, and then we were able to uh, show the patency of all the vasculature within the scaffold as you see here. Uh, so after, uh, you know, it's only uh, one day, uh, this is before implantation, the, uh, the whole entire liver uh, seeded with cells, and after implantation and after one uh, day, uh, we were able to show uh, the, um, the patency of uh, the liver tissue, and grossly, it uh, looks um, uh, normal liver. So uh, we uh, also uh, looked at the cells that we have, uh, you know, repopulated within the scaffolds, and we were able to show uh, you know, the presence of those cells that are surviving. So this is, uh, you know, uh, one example where we can use a donor's um, organ to uh, use uh, as a template to build uh, liver tissue. And, uh, you know, we uh, initially started with the whole entire liver, but, you know, we uh, now have, um, are using a, a single lobe. And I, you know, we do think that that would be enough to uh, improve, uh, you know, patients' uh, liver function, uh, you know, in the future. So uh, now this is uh, where you use uh, a, uh, an organ, an existing organ. However, uh, can we uh, build, uh, you know, tissue scaffold that is prevascularized? Can we integrate uh, blood vessels within a uh, tissue that you're building? Because that uh, gives you a lot more flexibility and can be used, uh, you know, as needed. So when you implant uh, anything, something, uh, any tissue construct, uh, when you implant it, the body starts to make new blood vessels, uh, you know, from periphery and slowly, uh, you know, creep in uh, towards the center uh, to vascularize an implant. However, that takes a long time. However, if you create a tissue construct with, uh, you know, with uh, vascular channels already embedded, then all what the body has to do is find the channel opening and connect to it. And then as soon as, uh, you know, uh, vascular channels are connected to native uh, blood vessel, the blood uh, will flow through and provide uh, nutrients and uh, oxygen to uh, those cells. So there are many, uh, you know, different uh, technologies and approaches uh, that can do that. Like one is bioprinting, one is, uh, you know, patterning, and the other is like using a casting uh, technique. So, and there are many more who, that could do that. Um, so uh, this is an example of uh, a casting method that we have, uh, uh, you know, employed uh, to develop a vascularized scaffold. And this, in this case, uh, we used as a kidney, uh, kidney as a model. So we take a donor kidney and then uh, inject, you know, uh, a casting polymer. That is thermoplastic, so when it is warm, uh, it is in liquid phase, and when it gets cold, uh, it solidifies. So when you inject it uh, through the artery, renal artery, it would fill all the vasculature uh, within the kidney. 
Now, once you do that, you, you cool it and uh, the polymers will solidify. And then what we do is we take, you know, we remove all the tissue part, you know, from uh, the, the kidney, leaving only the vascular tree uh, consisting of uh, your thermoplastic polymers. And then you have that vascular tree that is identical to uh, your uh, kidney vasculature. We then coat it with your, uh, you know, um, polymers or uh, any materials, uh, you know, like collagen. We use collagen because collagen uh, is the, uh, the biggest uh, comp uh, uh, composition material uh, within our body system. So we coat that with collagen and then heat it, warm it up, and make the casting polymer uh, in liquid form and flush it out, leaving only the collagen structure uh, with all the vasculature uh, within the kidney tissue. And then uh, you can use that scaffold and uh, attach vascular cells and kidney cells to it. So this is an example. Okay, so after you infuse a thermoplastic polymer, uh, you have a kidney vasculature uh, consisting of co collagen, uh, consisting of uh, the polymers. And then uh, if you look at closely, it can replicate the microarchitecture, uh, you know, structure of the kidney. This, this is glomerulus. This is very defined and very fine structure that it can pre, uh, preserve, uh, as well as uh, all the blood vessels within the, uh, the kidney tissue, which is perfusible. You can perfuse it uh, through the vasculature uh, and, uh, you know, it is uh, perfusible. And then uh, we see endothelial cells or vascular cells within uh, the lumen of the um, uh, the blood vessels as well as uh, kidney cells on the, in the parenchymal uh, sections. And then w when we implant this uh, into our body, uh, these um, vascularized uh, tissue construct integrate very well with host blood vessels as uh, you see here. Um, and uh, the cells that you've, uh, you know, um, implanted which uh, mature into renal tissue structure. So this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, an ongoing development and we do think that this uh, may have uh, many applications, not only kidney, but uh, any other solid organs like liver. Uh, and uh, this way we can generate and develop uh, you know, tissues. Uh, it doesn't have to be entirely uh, the whole liver, but, you know, part of liver tissue that could uh, help and augment or uh, enhance, um, you know, liver function in those patients. Another technology is bioprinting, of course, and we have, uh, you know, been working with bioprinting uh, system for uh, about 20 years, and, you know, we um, have been developing tissues uh, manually, uh, and you know how that goes. Uh, it is very inconsistent and uh, there's a lot of discrepancy. So we wanted to find uh, a way uh, to produce um, uh, the tissue more precisely, more consistently with uh, reproducibility. So uh, we looked into uh, using uh, bioprinter and back then uh, there was no bioprinting av available. So the only thing was, uh, you know, inkjet printing, people have, uh, you know, delivered individual cells, but not a tissue system. So uh, initially we, um, you know, purchased uh, inkjet printer with different color cartridges and you know, and uh, you modified it and replaced those color cartridges with different cells and different tissue element and also built uh, an elevator pl uh, platform or Z-axis where uh, the printer prints, uh, you know, um, two dimension once uh, and, you know, and then the elevator platform were depressed uh, one cell layer uh, deep. Uh, so you can, the printer could, um, you know, print over and over again 
uh, and creating a three-dimensional structure. So, uh, however, uh, we found out that, you know, it had, inkjet printer had so many, uh, you know, limitations. So we, uh, you know, put a team together, uh, you know, from engineer to uh, surgeons and, um, you know, uh, physiologists and biologists together to design and build our own printer uh, because there was no commercially available bio printer then, uh, you know, many years ago. And uh, this is one of the prototypes uh, that we uh, still use uh, to, uh, you know, this day, uh, which uh, can deliver many of the tissue elements uh, very precisely. Uh, and very fine structures that could, uh, you know, print, you know, the inner structure of tissues as you see here, uh, you know, like liver, hexagonal uh, liver structures, bladder, and uh, many other uh, tissue structures uh, in a very, uh, you know, uh, fine manner, which we cannot create uh, with our own hands. And uh, using the printer, we have uh, been developing many, uh, you know, tissue types from that range from simple to more complex or soft to uh, hard tissues, as you see here. And most of these uh, tissues have been, uh, you know, validated and demonstrated in uh, preclinical model. And Dr. Lee will uh, talk to you more about uh, how we can use a uh, bioprinter uh, to develop tissues for clinical application later on. So, uh, I think I'm running late, but um, uh, one last thing that I would like to share with you is using bioprinter. Uh, back in uh, 2016, NASA came out with a vascular tissue challenge, and they recognized uh, the challenges that uh, we all face uh, with uh, you know, uh, vascularization, and they uh, challenged the scientific community to come up with uh, a system, a vascularized tissue that consists of uh, human cells and, uh, you know, vasculature that could uh, actually be functional and survive for over a period of 30 days. So we, uh, you know, uh, went after this challenge. In uh, this case, we have used a DLP printer to print a liver tissue construct uh, and, uh, you know, hooked it up um, into a perfusion system and uh, kept it for over 30 days uh, and uh, made the uh, tissue survive, and this is uh, all the cells uh, within uh, the construct uh, were viable, and they survived, and we uh, printed uh, the construct with hepatocytes and uh, vascular cells, uh, vascular cells, of course, uh, to cover uh, the uh, vascular channels uh, within the construct, and then uh, and we have looked at uh, the liver tissue function, uh, the level of uh, production of albumin and bilirubin were similar to what you would see in humans. You know, uh, of course, you know, it is calculated based on a uh, number of cells. So this, uh, so, uh, you know, this approach, uh, one, uh, the first place uh, in NASA's vascular challenge that provided us an opportunity to take our t uh, printed construct to the International uh, Space Station. Uh, so uh, last year, recently, we have uh, you know uh, brought the bioprinted uh, liver tissue construct up in the space and uh, were successfully completed uh, a uh, AX2 space mission. And uh, what we have found, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, other uh, essays, uh, you know, uh, still going on, but what we have found was that, uh, the, you know, when we take the tissue construct, liver tissue construct up in the space, cells uh, maintain their viability, they are able to survive, and uh, were able to locate the cells, uh, you know, uh, and they were distributed uh, pretty uh, uniformly uh, within the construct, and more importantly, these uh, tissue constructs produce albumin, bilirubin, and urea, as you would see uh, in your liver uh, on Earth. 
So we're very excited about you know uh, this development and what we're really looking for in a unique environment of microgravity is that uh, you know we do our hypothesis is that we can create and develop better microcapillary system uh, in in the space because you don't have to uh, you know deal with uh, the gravity because when you do cell culture everything settles down and the uh, formation of uh, capillary structure or vasculature uh, you know on earth uh, would be not as uniform, and uh, the development of microcapillary is uh, the most critical portion. You know, where we are able to create bigger vessels, but you know, microcapillary is where the action is. That's where uh, you know fluid exchange, uh, electrolyte exchange, uh, and oxygen diffusion occurs. So uh, we're hoping that um, you know, microgravity environment uh, would uh, provide. Uh, that manufacturing edge, uh, you know, when we develop new tissue. And we uh, uh, have uh, two um, uh, uh, flights uh, that are planned, one in um, August and the other one is not, uh, you know, determined yet uh, for uh, 2024. And we have uh, one or two more uh, flights that we're planning for 2025. So. Uh, we're very excited about this development, and this is, you know, uh, to our knowledge, uh, the first uh, tissue construct that were taken to uh, the orbit. And obviously, we cannot do the, you know, uh, this kind of experiment alone. And uh, it really takes a village to, uh, to you know, to develop a tissue construct uh, that, uh, you know, could be taken to. Uh, a space. So lastly, where do we want to uh, take this? It's not about, you know, taking the tissue construct to the space, but, uh, you know, with this technology in general, you know, if we bioprint a vascularized uh, solid organs like liver, kidney, or uh, pancreas, what are we going to do with it? The eventual destination is to the patient. So uh, we have been uh, working uh, to develop uh, an, uh, a way to uh, integrate this into the body. So this is uh, a, a pancreas tissue construct that we have printed, uh, and um, and that uh, you know tissue construct was connected directly to uh, the. Uh, in, a, in an animal model uh, to the blood vessels like you would do with transplantation. It's not about uh, implanting it elsewhere and uh, you know, expecting the, the body to make new blood vessels. This already has blood vessels and uh, you know, because of that we can just connect directly to uh, the living uh, blood vessels so that the blood uh, provision would occur immediately and you know we uh, recently have been successful in uh, you know connecting it and uh, showing that uh, the um, you know we did this in rats and red blood uh, is perfused through the uh, the implants so we're very excited about this development and we do think that uh, if we continue to develop uh, we can address one of the challenges, major challenges, donor order short, uh, organ shortage. We can create uh, an organ, implantable organ, and uh, just implant and give a new organ to uh, these patients rather than waiting or using, uh, you know, a donor organ. So, uh, so with bioprinting, it is a cool technology, very uh, you know, uh, incredible technology that really advanced uh, in many areas uh, in our field. So we envision using this uh, bioprinting uh, technology in the clinic. When a patient comes uh, into the clinic, we can use patients' uh, CT or MRI uh, data and reverse engineer and create uh, a uh, you know a protocol that would uh, develop that would uh, reproduce the tissue or organ that the patients would need, and that that printed uh, organ 
can be delivered to the operating room where surgeon can, uh, you know, uh, introduce it in the body. So, uh, you know, this is a very exciting time. Many, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, technologies are being developed, uh, and um, and these, uh, you know, the application uh, gets expanded, uh, you know, uh, as fast uh, and faster and faster every single day. However, you know, we must develop uh, uh, a solution or solutions to many of the challenges that we uh, face in developing uh, new tissues and organs um, and uh, so that we can, uh, you know, seal that, you know, translational gap. Uh, you know, there are challenges everywhere and uh, those have to be identified and resolved in order to proceed to the next level uh, to reach uh, our ultimate de uh, destination. So, um, by, to that, uh, lastly, I would like to thank our institute members. Uh, we uh, currently, um, you know, work on, uh, you know, over 30, 40 different, uh, you know, tissues and organ types, and we uh, currently have uh, an ongoing or planned, uh, you know, clinical trial, 16 of them, and uh, everybody's working, you know, very committed and dedicated to uh, develop new tissues so that we could uh, help many patients. And of course, I would like to, uh, you know, thank our sponsors who share the same vision as we do. Uh, without their, their support, we wouldn't be where we are today, uh, you know, and uh, to fulfill our mission, you know, develop this technology to improve patients' health. Thank you so much. Sorry, Dr. Lee, uh, I cut into your time. So thank you so much, sir, for giving us such uh, valuable insights into uh, vascularization and introducing 3D bioprinting. We are just in nursery class. We are just learning the ABC. So uh, now I invite our second speaker, Professor uh, Sang Lee. Uh, Professor Sangli is a chemical engineer by profession and a professor in the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And today he'll be uh, talking about 3D bioprinting applications and future directions. Okay, uh, thank you for kind introduction. I'm not sure I really need uh, this presentation because Dr. Yu uh, explained very well about uh, uh, bioprinting already. <coughs> but uh, I'm uh, truly uh, grateful for this opportunity to speak uh, today and share my insights on bioprinting technology in uh, tissue engineering and regenerative medicines. So uh, in 2010, the economist uh, published it, uh, this cartoon showing a machine that printing organ and tissue in the operating room for patient. And since then, number of publications uh, related to 3D bioprinting technology in format dramatically uh, increased as you see here. And uh, now uh, we can uh, find many uh, promising outcomes through uh, 3D bioprinting technology in the many labs. And uh, there are also some clinical uh, studies ongoing. So 3D printing has many names, solid preform uh, 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 technologies and additive te manufacturing. Also, we can also say uh, rapid prototyping. So basically, uh, it is layer by layer process so you can fabricate uh, such a complex uh, structure easily compared uh, with other uh, fabrication uh, methods. So uh, as a result, uh, 3D printing impact uh, various industry that including uh, fashion and automobile architecture, and also we can have a uh, printed uh, handbook this time. So why uh, 3D printing in the field of uh, tissue engineering and uh, regent medicine because a major challenging 
for tissue and organ engineering is the production of 3D uh, biomimetic uh, cellular construct of a uh, clinically uh, relevant size and shape uh, with structural integrity as well as uh, tissue complexities. And since uh, 3D printing can print satellite in hydrogel uh, construct to manufacture uh, complex multi-cellular uh, living tissues, uh, this uh, technology could uh, really benefit in the field. So 3D printing uh, is a little different than uh, conventional 3D printing. It requests uh, many components, that including medical imaging, uh, such as CT and MRI to obtain uh, patient uh, tissue and organ structures, and uh, reverse engineering technology uh, that could uh, generate a 3D CAD model that is nearly necessary for automatic uh, 3D uh, printing process. And uh, biomaterials as a bioink that is necessary to support uh, proper printability as well as uh, provide uh, tissue specific environment to accommodate uh, cells. And uh, 3D bioprinter, uh, currently uh, there are several uh, printing methodology uh, can be available for bioprinting purpose, such as extrusion and jetting and uh, sterilisography. And since we're talking about cell-based approach, transrenal cell source is one of the major components for bioprinting purpose. So more importantly, the aim of 3D bioprinting, utilizing 3D printing technology is to fabricate clinically applicable tissue and organ construct for uh, treating uh, patient. So this slide shows uh, 3D bioprinting workflow from medical imaging to actual printed constructs. The shape of a tissue construct is ensured by representing clinical imaging data as a 3D CAD models of a tissue or organ and translating this model into a pattern that control uh, printing motions. So actually uh, dispensing cells or biomaterial to specific location to build 3D tissue architectures. So as already uh, introduced, uh, we develop our own uh, printing system we call integrated uh, tissue and printing system. So basically, uh, this printing system has multiple uh, dispensing models. So that means that we can uh, print multiple components in a single structure. That could include multiple cells, multiple biomaterial system, and sometimes we can incorporate many uh, biological uh, factors uh, in the uh, structure to stimulate uh, cells. And uh, this uh, could be a good example how uh, ITAP system works. So we target to print a uh, human scale of ear uh, cartilage construct. So as I mentioned that uh, we can start from uh, uh, medical imaging. So we use the CT to obtain our patient uh, images and then generating a uh, 3D CAD model of a uh, human scale uh, cartilage structure. And then we can divide the materials. So as you see in this movie, in order to uh, pre uh, fabricate human scale, uh, the cartilage structure, we use that uh, three component. So we have a hydrogel system that contains auricular uh, chondrocyte, and we have polymeric material that support a uh, 3D structure. At the same time, we also have a sacrificial material that is supporting a uh, printing process. So, so these uh, three components sequentially print, and then uh, build that uh, 3D uh, structure of ear cartilages, as you've seen in uh, this movie. And uh, it, this movie uh, uh, is uh, moving very fast, but it took uh, more over four to six months of fabrication time. So uh, even uh, since we have, uh, we can actually control the environment in terms of humidity and temperature during our printing process, there is no uh, cell damage we can uh, see during this uh, process. So after printing uh, to de de uh, determine uh, whether this printed ear cartilage would mature in vivo, so we implant them uh, in the dosal subcutaneous space of the eight diamond mouse and isolate them uh, one and uh, two months after implantation for further analysis. So as you see here, we could see uh, their cartilage-like tissue formation and also mechanically uh, very similar like native ear cartilage uh, what we have. So 3D printing uh, not only emphasize tissue shape and size like ear or bone, 
but also we can control their inner internal geometry of construct such as pore size or pore geometry. So this could be a good example then uh, we applied uh, such a uh, design concept uh, to uh, print the bone scaffold for mandibular bone reconstructions. So everyone knows that when you implant something in the body, there is always a contribution between host response and uh, tissue regeneration. So we hypothesize that, uh, uh, in order to achieve this goal, we hypothesize that uh, dense uh, external layer that could uh, delay host cell uh, infiltration, such as implant motor cells or fibrotic cells into the scaffold, but at the same time, uh, high uh, pores core structure in the scaffold that allow a bone and vascular ingrowth from the adjacent uh, tissues. And uh, in order to validate uh, this uh, design concept strategy, we create a bony defect in lead uh, mandibular bone, as you, as you see here. And based on uh, CT uh, images, we generate a 3D CAD model of bony defect and fabricate a bone scaffold using 3D printing uh, workflow. So based on our uh, uh, design strategy and our, our hypothesis, we uh, fabricate uh, the scaffold that has a uh, very small uh, pore uh, size of external uh, layers and highly porous uh, inner uh, structure in the uh, scaffold. And also we also compare with the control that doesn't have dense uh, uh, external layers and uh, it is highly uh, porous structures. So when uh, we implanted these two different uh, uh, scaffolds with different uh, inner geometry, uh, we, uh, 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 we uh, after implantation, uh, we could see uh, new bone formation that has uh, detected by uh, CT analysis, uh, which was highlighted by a yellow mask and showing uh, increasing occup uh, uh, occupation of a defective region with new bone. So it is uh, obviously, uh, you could see uh, there's some uh, difference between a biomimetic scaffold and a control scaffold. So with a dense external layer, we, cast, we could see more homogeneous bone, uh, new bone formation in the entire uh, region of that uh, scaffold we implanted. But uh, if you look at the control scaffold, we can only see new bone formation at the boundaries. So why uh, this happens? So when you look at the histologies, uh, 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 you uh, could see here, so upper uh, uh, histology is showing that uh, control scaffold. So you could see there is more fibro tissue in growth, uh, more than a uh, bone uh, new bone formation. So that means that uh, if there is, uh, so there, uh, we hypothesize there is some competition between. So if there is more host response occur and feel that fibro tissue in the uh, implanted tissue construct, there is no chance to ingrowth bone ingrowth. But if we have dense layer that could delay fibre tissue ingrowth into the scaffold, there is more chance to bone ingrowth from uh, adjacent bone. So we use that exactly same materials, same technology, but a different geometry that could make totally different clinical outcomes. So that's the such a power of utilizing 3D bioprinting. You can apply your own design strategy to your printed constructs. And uh, we can definitely also see uh, their vascularization, uh, vascularization as well. And uh, here is a dip, a dip, uh, different approaches. Uh, we uh, use that uh, highly elastic uh, silk uh, fibrin based bioink for meniscus uh, printing because meniscus requests uh, highly uh, elastic properties. So we, uh, in order to print a meniscus, we have a silk frame uh, uh, the pattern in the structure, as well as we have a cell-laden uh, hydrogel uh, bioink system that is sequentially printed to fabricate uh, meniscus uh, constructs. And uh, this, I'm not talking about too much detail about that uh, chemistry, but there is multiple uh, cross-thinking process uh, that could uh, integrate with this system to making this construct is more stable and mechanically uh, uh, mechanic, uh, provide you know mechanical uh, property for uh, meniscus, and especially as you see in uh, uh, this uh, graph, uh, is showing that uh, our printed construct is highly elastic. Uh, uh, that is compounded by cyclic uh, 
stress and relaxation test. And more importantly, uh, we could also see uh, when you implanted this construct uh, in the animal models, we could see their uh, tissue development. We could see their collagen production as well as uh, gag uh, production. And especially, uh, we look at the uh, collagen uh, tissue maturation. So we perform our um, imaging analysis uh, using ICM blue uh, serious red staining to uh, see our uh, collagen fiber orientations. So as you see here, so we could see online, uh, online uh, collagen fiber that is very similar like uh, native meniscus uh, cartilages. And uh, this is another example. We could, uh, uh, there is, uh, so we can also uh, target to engineering skeletal muscles. So maybe many uh, people may know about this lab grown meat that has been developed uh, over uh, 10 years ago, but at the time, uh, when you uh, fabricate just one burger, you, you have to pay uh, a lot of money. It was more than uh, 300,000. But now, uh, since we have a uh, mass uh, culture system, the price uh, is getting down, and then uh, we may have that, uh, this burger uh, uh, soon. But uh, what I'm talking about is this is basically uh, uh, skeletal muscle tissue cultures. So engineering uh, skeletal muscle. But we are not believe that this muscle is functional because there is no orientation and there is no vasculature and no innovations. But using 3D bioprinting, we can achieve that cellular level orientation very easily. So you can print skeletal muscle cell with uh, one direction, then you can achieve cellular level orientation that is very similar like uh, native muscles. So this is example, we printed skeletal muscle, and then uh, we can mature them in, uh, 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 in vitro, then we can achieve very aligned thick uh, muscle fiber structures. And uh, when you compare with uh, just uh, culture without our printing process, we see that uh, uh, printed uh, skeletal muscle uh, shows the better uh, viability as well as better uh, maturation and showing a uh, high uh, contractility. But as I mentioned that uh, innovation is very necessary for engineering skeletal muscle. Without uh, innovation, this may be not the functional uh, when you implant it. So uh, in order to achieve that goal, so we uh, also printed neural cells with uh, skeletal muscle cells. So with uh, neural uh, stem cell with engineered muscle, we found that uh, they are more functional uh, in vitro. So in order to validate uh, this construct, we are creating a 40% uh, muscle defect uh, in uh, TA muscle of the lab, and then we implanted this construct. So as you see in uh, this gross appearance, so uh, control uh, with, uh, without uh, any treatment, you could see a very severe muscular dystrophy. But uh, with muscles, uh, printed muscle construct, we see uh, their muscle, muscle volume uh, maintenance. But more importantly, when you look at that muscle post functional analysis, uh, engineering muscle, uh, printed muscle scaffold with neural cells showing a very close over 80% muscle force uh, re uh, restoration at uh, 8 weeks after implantation. And also we uh, confirmed an older histology and uh, uh, we found that uh, printed uh, skeletal muscle construct uh, contribute uh, newly uh, formed muscle tissue that could uh, maintain uh, muscle, uh, muscle function restorations. And yeah, because of uh, time limitation, I, I'm not uh, going into too much detail, but uh, I can definitely uh, discuss uh, after my presentation, if you have uh, any questions. And we found that uh, neural integration that could accelerate innovation, host, uh, host, uh, uh, no integration uh, when you implant it, and also we found that proper vascularization of this construct as well. So same strategy, we also apply this same uh, strategy to uh, fabricate uh, cardiac uh, tissues. So we printed uh, cardiomyocyte uh, with uh, certain uh, patterns. And uh, for example, uh, we could see a different pattern of uh, cardiomyocyte. So we printed uh, uh, fiber structure, and web structure and uh, patchy structure. Uh, after uh, two or uh, three weeks uh, in culture, then we found that they're automatic uh, the beating. And also we, saw, we also compound their maturation uh, using immunostaining for uh, alpha-actinine and uh, connexin-43. 
And uh, time goes on, uh, this uh, printed construct uh, could uh, more mature. And uh, in order to uh, investigate uh, such a feasibility using bioprinted cardiac tissue as a in vitro 3D models, we uh, examine uh, with uh, drug response. Uh, drug uh, response. So you could see this is baseline, and then when you apply uh, apropimin, you could see uh, the beating is more stronger and more fast. And then after remove this drug, then uh, they uh, become a baseline. Then when you uh, treat with a uh, carbacol, uh, you could see uh, the beating uh, delay and uh, weaker. So this response is very similar like our uh, native uh, cardiac tissues. And we can also apply uh, this uh, 3D printing uh, technology to fabricate composite tissue like uh, muscle tendons. So muscle tendon uh, seems to be two different tissue, but it is not true because it requests functional interfacial tissue between. If there is no uh, functional interfacial tissue, this may be not uh, working. So compared with other uh, fabrication methodology, if you utilize uh, 3D printing techniques, we can simply mimic that uh, structures. So we printed muscle cell one side and tendon cell the other side, and then making some overlap. And then uh, in culture, uh, at the beginning, there is no strong interaction between two different tissue. But when you look at that uh, seven day in culture, then they have strong binding each other. And then when you look at that uh, gene expression, there is uh, many uh, genes that related to uh, muscular uh, junction uh, uh, tissues. So if you provide uh, right environment uh, to the cells, can uh, make something that is that's ne uh, what are they necessary. And the other approach, we also target to uh, composite osseochondral tissue that is uh, required bone and cartilage. And also, you may know that uh, bone and cartilage, there is very specific zone between. So in order to achieve these goals, we uh, printed a uh, construct with a uh, different uh, environment. So bone, uh, we are pro uh, we utilizing uh, BMP uh, mimetic peptide so that uh, we can provide more oxygenic uh, environment. And uh, cartilage region, we provide uh, TGF paramimetic uh, peptide so that this uh, could uh, induce uh, chondrogenesis. Uh, chondrogenesis. And uh, between uh, bone and uh, cartilage, we have a uh, uh, calcified uh, chondrogenic uh, region so that uh, we could also mimic that uh, functional interface. And uh, we also are interested in uh, developing a uh, portable unit that could be immediately utilizing, especially uh, this project to target to bad pair. So this portable uh, bio uh, printer for uh, skin, uh, skin bio printer has uh, two uh, major functions. So we have a 3D scanner that can uh, determine a skin wound, and uh, we have a dispenser that can uh, deliver a skin cell to wound regions. So in order to validate uh, this uh, prototype, so we're creating a 10 by 10 uh, skin wound in fig, and then we apply uh, our uh, 3D printing. So as you uh, look at the result, uh, we see uh, there is a severe uh, skin contraction uh, with no treat or without cells. And also, uh, we found that allogenic cell is not uh, really functional. But uh, when you look at that autologous uh, skin cell at the printing in that uh, wound region, we found that there is very uh, minimum uh, skin, uh, skin uh, cont uh, contraction, as well as we found the newly formed epidermis layers. And uh, uh, this is recent paper we uh, uh, paper uh, I would like to share with that. So using a 3D printing, we try to mimic that human skin with multi uh, cellular uh, cell types. So we uh, could have uh, three different layer, different layer with a different cell component that really mimic that uh, uh, skin, human skin, as you see here. And then when we apply uh, this bioprinted construct in animals we found that uh, a bioprinted skin is sa very similar like a human uh, skin architectures. And uh, same uh, strategy. So we uh, target to skin wound in the face. So compared with other region, uh, skin uh, wound in the face is very uh, challenging because uh, very heterogeneous uh, contour compared to other side. So we uh, develop our own uh, bio uh, mask uh, uh, design concept uh, for 
uh, facial skin uh, regeneration. So based on uh, patient uh, face anatomy, we uh, have uh, we are creating a, a biomass a structure, and then uh, uh, we have we actually have uh, three uh, layers. So we have wound dressing layer, and keratinocyte layer, and dermal cell layer, fibrous layer. So this could be uh, applied to our face uh, uh, directly. So in order to validate uh, uh, this uh, structure, we create uh, we. Firstly, I create a face shape on the nude mouse back, as you see here, and then we create a skin on the, on the face shape, and then we apply a biomass, and then we found the newly formed skin regeneration. So absolutely, this is very premature, but uh, this could be a good example how we utilize the printing technology for uh, such a clinical uh, challenges. And uh, we can also uh, modify our printing system to uh, fabricate uh, tubular hollow structures. So th uh, this is uh, one example we uh, target to print that uh, urethral structure that uh, requests uh, two major uh, layers. One is small, small layer and epithelial layers. And uh, we are also uh, developing a uh, tissue-specific uh, bioink system. Uh, this example is we uh, target to uh, deliver, uh, develop uh, kidney specific uh, bioink that is derived from uh, kidney shams. And uh, we, uh, based on our chemical modification, this bioink is printable. And uh, even though uh, it has many uh, process uh, we uh, applied, uh, we still have a uh, kidney related uh, cytokine and growth factor that is pre uh, still uh, preserved in the bioink system. And then in vitro studies was very promising to utilizing this uh, kidney ECM bioink for uh, further in vivo studies. And uh, we also uh, confirmed that in vitro renal uh, functional assay, and we found that uh, this ECM could uh, enhance many uh, kidney function uh, in terms of their cellular activities. So we, uh, 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 in order to validate uh, this ECM, for actual uh, kidney uh, regeneration, we are creating uh, a defect in the kidney directly, and then we apply uh, this printed construct. And as you see in uh, this uh, histological outcome, so we uh, we uh, actually uh, used the uh, gel mice control that uh, there is no uh, kidney specific uh, functions. And then when you compound with uh, uh, compare with gel the ECM. Uh, Bioink construct showing a better cellularity. But more importantly, when you look at the, their uh, the functional uh, structures, we found that uh, newly formed uh, renal tubular structure uh, in that uh, ECM uh, bioink construct uh, that is not appear uh, in the gelma construct. And also, we found also newly formed glomerular structure with our printed constructs as well. And uh, I'm provide several examples of how we utilize 3D printing for implantation, but we are also very interested in uh, developing or uh, utilizing this technique to develop an uh, in vitro model as well. So there is many uh, technology currently applied. So for example, uh, if you provide the microphysiological properties of biomems bio and bio, uh, my, uh, microfluidics uh, needed, but uh, it is basically a uh, 2D cell culture, not uh, really a uh, 3D tissue culture that is integrated with the technologies. So we uh, try to utilize 3D printing technology. We printed the microfluidics channel along with uh, cell printing so that uh, we can achieve uh, reproductibility as well as uh, we can apply a microphysical condition to our printed uh, cells. And uh, this is uh, uh, such a prototype. So if you target a single tissue, you have uh, just one a single microfluidics channel. But if you want to uh, see uh, uh, response bit, uh, with uh, different uh, tissues, we can have multiple uh, stacking uh, microfluidics channels so that uh, you could actually see their interaction between. So. As an example, uh, we are able to uh, the print a uh, liver organoid in the chip direct during the printing process. And another example, we can also print uh, cardiomyocyte in the chamber. So, uh, so that uh, finally we can uh, validate uh, their functional outcomes. 
with uh, micro uh, physiological conditions. And uh, we are also interested in uh, developing high throughput uh, 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 tissue or cancer models. So high throughput is very essential, uh, essential for essential for uh, uh, future uh, drug screening and cytotoxic uh, tests. And also this could uh, provide uh, more patient uh, specific uh, uh, models. So, uh, so uh, in order to achieve this, uh, we utilizing automatic uh, printing pr uh, system. We printed cells. Uh, this case, we printed uh, breast uh, cancer cells. And depending on uh, dispensing space and uh, production uh, time, we can actually control their size and uh, their uh, morphology as well. And this can be easily uh, integrated with uh, ECM so that uh, we can provide a better uh, micro environment with the cells and uh, control their aggressiveness and uh, angiogenesis. And this is uh, several examples how we control their geometry morphology and mimic that uh, the function of tumors. And summary, sorry about uh, <laughs> uh, 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 making out too much, uh, 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 but uh, we uh, actually try to develop not just only bio ink or bio printer, we really want to, to developing more clinically relevant and applicable workflow so that we can deliver this technology in the uh, clinics. So that's our goal and this is our summary. Uh, we uh, target to very simple bone and cartilage, but we also target to very complex kidney, heart, and liver as well. And I only have two or more slides, sorry about that. So I'd like to mention about such a uh, direction uh, to utilizing uh, 3D printing techniques. So now we can see uh, such a progression from single simple tissue like bone and cartilage and skin. So which has been a great potential to be uh, translated to the clinical application within a short time. And there is some uh, clinical application trials is ongoing. And uh, we can find that uh, so also valuable uh, outcome from organized contract tissue uh, as I uh, presented skeletal muscle or cardiac tissue and composite tissue such as bone and cartilage and muscle and tendon. And ultimately, I believe we can fabricate through the organ such as liver and kidney, heart, uh, and so on. But that requires extremely complex functional inter, uh, inner uh, structure and microvasculatures. So in order to achieve this goal, we still need better uh, 3D printing hardware and uh, software uh, should uh, support that all the necessary uh, the process and also we need better uh, transitional cell source and uh, better uh, tissue specifying so that uh, we finally achieve our goal and hopefully one day we could see via uh, the printing tissue and organ in the operating for our own patient. And Thank you for your attention and your interest, and I'd like to thank you to our all team members and our funding source. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee, and uh, very, very eye-opening things for us, and also Professor Yu. Uh, I know we need more time for discussions. Uh, we are very grateful to you, and uh, I hope in the next two days that you are here in the institute, more students and faculty can interact. In the interest of the time, uh, we would uh, conclude this session and thank you for your great teachings today. Thank you. Thank you. And to everyone, the institute observes the foundation day at two o'clock on Saturday. We hope you will enjoy and enrich us.